Hello. Here we are back with uh, Chapter 7, a new, brand new chapter. Chapter 7 looks at the two other main areas of macroeconomics that we study, and that is unemployment and inflation. And so this lecture, Lecture 1, will look at unemployment. And in, in uh, both categories of unemployment and inflation, we're going to be using data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, known as the BLS. You can Google just BLS, and it'll take you, uh, this should be the first choice, it should take you right there. And there you can find data on uh, anything on inflation, prices, and labor markets. I copied the mission statement of the Bureau of Labor Statistics right here. It's the principal fact-finding agency for the federal government in the broad field of labor economics and statistics. The BLS is an independent national statistical agency that collects, processes, analyzes, and disseminates essential statistical data to the American public, the U.S. Congress, other federal agencies, state and local governments, business and labor. The BLS also serves as a statistical resource to be used um, to the Department of Labor. And I actually had a, f a few students who actually work for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Usually they were part-time employees and they would spend their time collecting local data on usually on, on uh, prices. They usually worked uh, to collect data for the Consumer Price Index. So when we talk about labor markets and unemployment, we're going to be talking about the concept of the uh, labor force, and this would be the civilian labor force. And this represents people 16 and older who are officially classified as either employed or unemployed. Now what we mean by the civilian labor force means we do not include anyone who's in the military. And so if you are in the military, uh, you are not part of the labor force. And also uh, does not include anyone who is in an institution. So people in an institution, such as prison or some kind of a mental institution, are also not considered part of the labor force. And so who are the employed people? They are any person in 16 order who during the survey week work for pay for one hour or more or work for no pay for 15 hours or more in a family run business. So the, what they do each month, and it's I believe the uh, week that has the 12th uh, day of the month in there, and so they take a survey during that entire week, and they collect data on people who are 16 and older who work for at least one hour of pay during that week or for no pay, no pay but at least 15 hours in a family run business such as a family restaurant, a family farm, something like that. So essentially, if you work for one hour at all, you are considered fully employed for the entire uh, month if you work for one hour during that week, or for, again, 15 hours or more with no pay in a family-run business. It includes people who are on sick leave, holiday, vacation, bad weather, uh, child care problems, labor disputes, maternity or paternity leave, or other kind of family or personal obligations. Uh, this all makes sense to me, except maybe the, the um, labor disputes. I mean, if you have all these other kind of leaves here, vacation leave, holiday leave, you have a job uh, to come back to. If you're in a labor dispute, a strike, that job may or may not be there um, after the uh, dispute is over. But nonetheless, that's how the Bureau of Labor Statistics looks at people who are uh, considered employed. And the other group of people are people who are unemployed. And again, this is any person, 16 or older, who was without work for the survey week but who was available for work and actively looking for work. And so during that week, you have to have three conditions. One, you, you do not have a job, but, also, but you were available for work, which means you were not in a hospital or outside of the country, and you were actively looking for work. And those are the same uh, conditions also if you want to receive unemployment benefits as well. Uh, one of the things we can calculate on the exams is what is known as a labor force participation rate. And this is the percentage of the population that is 16 and older that is in the labor force. And it's a simple calculation. What they do is they take the labor force, which are the employed, unemployed uh, persons, and divide by the population. And again, the population is all civilian, non-institutionalized people age 16 or older. So again, uh, people in the military are excluded from this calculation, as well as people in prison and um, mental health types uh, institutions. And this tells us the percentage of the population that is involved in the labor market. And so here I have some numbers. So 
So we have a graph from, again, uh, the Federal Reserve side of St. Louis. And looks at the labor force participation rate from 1950 to currently. And you can see a major trend from the 60s to about 2000 was an increase in the labor force participation rate from about 59, 60% to up here at about 67%. And the main reason there was the, end, uh, the entry of a lot of women into the labor market uh, from the 60s and 70s, 70s and 90s. And that led to the increase. But then we notice a large decrease here. And it's hard to explain what was going on here. We know what happened with the Great Recession in 2008, 9, 10. A lot of people retired early who were in their 50s and 60s because they got laid off, terminated, and they felt that they would not be able to find reemployment. And so they left there, but we had a trend that was already starting at about here. And then we had a bottom, a kind of bottom out here. And so even though the recession ended in about 2009 and 10, we still had a large decrease there. And so I went and on, I went into the uh, labor, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics to find some reasons there. And it looked like here that again, a lot of people retired from the Great Recession, but also it continued as it drops as a result of, of males 25 to 55 with high school education or less, and they have left the labor market due to lower wages and less employment opportunities. So people without a college degree have been having, have, have been having a much more difficult time to find employment with decent weight wages. And it's not, um, forget about the opiate epidemic that has taken thousands out of the labor market, the job market, and has devastated many areas of this country. And um, there's a video that I loaded on uh, next to this lecture that looks at uh, some more evidence as to what's been going on with the opiate um, um, uh, crisis. And of course, then we have COVID-19, which hit right here, with a huge decrease in labor force participation as people have been locked up in their homes, uh, not able to go out there and look for work, and, and that has led to a large decrease in the labor force participation, particip labor force participation rate right there. There was a, a sharp rebound there, and so things are kind of hectic right now. This is I'm doing this lecture in early September 2020. And so right now, we are not quite sure what the data is going to show for the next two, three, four months. Then we come to the unemployment rate. And this will definitely be on the uh, uh, Section 2 exam and the final exam. And this is the percentage of people in the labor force who are officially classified as unemployed. It's a very simple calculation. You take the unemployed persons, that was defined earlier and divide that by the labor force that was also defined earlier and that gives you your unemployment rate. In April 2020, uh, the rate is 8.4%. Uh, it just came out last week. Down here we have data again. You can see that the shaded areas, if you can see those, are recessions. And in recession, you can see there's a high spike there. And so kind of a large decrease up and down with unemployment. We pretty much move anywhere between 2.5% uh, up here to a little over 10 percent and this case right here was the COVID one and that was almost 15 percent. Huge increase in unemployment just in a couple of months. The good news is that we had a sharp decline here in um, July of 2020 got down to a little above 10 percent and then I said like in August it's 8.4 percent but for September, October, November, December who knows what's going to happen. Um, and we don't know exactly also the hours these people have. Again, if you work for one hour for pay, you're considered fully employed for the entire month. So these people could be working maybe you know four or five hours a week, and we consider them fully employed when they're really not. So we're not quite sure about the hours and the pay they're taking home. Then when people are not in the labor force, and we have what's called discouraged workers, which we'll talk more about later. These are people who have given up looking for work. Remember, to be counted as unemployed, you have to be actively looking for work. These people have given up. They probably look for work for months, two months, three months, and there's nothing out there, and therefore they just give up. And if you give up, you drop out of the figures. It doesn't mean you're still not unemployed. It doesn't mean you're still not hurting. It simply means you're not counted as unemployed anymore. 
And then we have st uh, spouses who stay at home and take care of the kids, do the laundry, change the oil, uh, fix the roof. Most people are working hard at home, but again, because they're not working for pay, it doesn't count as being employed. And then we have college students. If you are working, we pick you up as being employed, but if you're not working and you're looking for work, we don't count you as unemployed as long as you're a full-time student uh, because the BLS considers you to be employed as a student even when you're not, you're not counted in the labor force. And of course, as people don't wish to work, ones who are retired uh, or uh, win the lottery, uh, want to take time off, things like that. And I'll stop there. We'll make that lecture part one, and I'll come, uh, come back here and start off here with uh, part two.